uh, our uh, intensives have uh, have really been filling up, and we've had waiting lists. And most people that are coming for the intensives are coming because of the effects of uh, the year of being in, you know, the pandemic. Uh, it's brought on sadness, it's brought on depression, it's brought on uh, overeating, it's uh, people have relapsed in uh, alcohol. They've, uh, anyway, majority of the people that uh, I've seen the last few intensives have come because of problems of the pandemic. So I think it's pretty much universal, and I thought it would it might be a good topic to talk about uh, the difference between sadness and depression. Uh, and uh, sadness is an emotion. You know, something happens when we get sad over it. Uh, you know, like I ta talked about, you know, I made a little video about my greenhouse and how I've lost all the, <clears throat> the flowers uh, due to the blizzard and the electricity going off. Well, I was sad about that, uh, but not depressed. And see, I've got my little flowers in here that I planted, I uh, wanted y'all to, to see them. Uh, and that brings me a lot of joy. Plant flowers of any kind bring me joy. But anyway, sadness is an emotion where depression is a mental illness. And that's got to be very much distinguished between the two, that sadness is an emotion. Uh, it happens when, you know, through disappointments or <clears throat> uh, sadness is, uh, is brief. Uh, and depression lasts much longer. It persists much longer. Uh, sadness is specific to uh, a reaction, you know, a reaction to something. Are they still there? Yeah. Okay, I can't see them, but they're still there. That's all right. Uh, sadness is brief, uh, and depression lasts much, much longer. You got it. Okay. Uh, okay, going back, sadness is specific reaction to something that has happened. Uh, you know, you lose your job, or uh, a child is sick, or you get sick. Something happens specific, and there's sadness around that. <clears throat> and uh, sadness can temporarily change your mood, but depression changes your life. That's the difference. Sadness can temporarily change your mood, <clears throat> but depression changes your life. So sadness is subjective, where depression is diagnosable. Uh, you must, if it's if you're depressed, <clears throat> there's people who have situational depression, and that's kind of the sadness part. Situational depression is where something happens, maybe a death, uh, you know, something major, a major loss, and they will get in what we call situational depression, and it may last a while. And if it lasts, you know, more than two weeks, uh, you know, we recommend that you go to your physician and, uh, you know, see that now situational depression, it w can last a while, but it will lift. It will lift. Uh, but clinical depression is mental illness, and it's not going to lift. And mental illness needs to be treated uh, by a psychiatrist, someone in the mental health field, uh, a psychiatrist to get it diagnosed and to prescribe medication. Uh, you know, I went into the drug alcohol field years ago, years ago, when we didn't have the types of medication that we have today. And I was taught no drugs. If you're an alcoholic, drug addict, no drugs, no drugs, zero. Uh, and that's kind of what I grew up with because my mother was a prescription drug addict and alcoholic uh, and I made a decision that I wasn't going to take any kind of meds and my sister and I would hardly ever take an aspirin. Uh, and so, but through education and, uh, you know, like while I was working in the specific, working in the drug alcohol field, uh, there was these... Uh, medications like Prozac, I believe was the first one that came on the market. Uh, they're uh, SSRIs, they are, uh, what they do is uh, they don't, <clears throat> it will, can uh, help depression tremendously. Now this type of medication, it doesn't jack you up, you know, it's not, you know, you know it won't 
make you high or it won't to make, it's not a downer drug. If you really have depression, what medication will do, it'll bring you up to baseline. It'll bring you up to feeling pretty much what normal might look like or feel like. <clears throat> now, medication, I think, is very important. Uh, but there's other things that people can do. It's not just about medication. Uh, one of the best things that people can do is get you a good therapist. Get you someone that understands uh, depression, clinical depression, and that will help you walk through it. Because you'll go along and you can be doing pretty good for a while, and then all of a sudden the bottom drops out. Uh, and if you don't have someone, a therapist, that really understands depression and can hang in there with you, uh, and I hate to say that there are folks, and you know, all of us are, any of us in the mental health field can sometimes not be, it's not about judging, but we might have uh, made a judgment call about something where sometimes we will uh, maybe think that uh, a client isn't working hard enough or doing what they need to do to stay out of the depression. Uh, and that is not up to the therapist to decide that. The therapist cannot decide that. When a person is depressed, <clears throat> and I was saying, I've been saying, I've never suffered depression. Well, yes, I have. Of course I have suffered depression. I just don't happen to suffer from it now, and uh, by the grace of God, uh, and some good medication that I've, I never thought that I would take any medication. And I'm honest, I don't mind telling anybody. I take Prozac and taken it for years, and my family wants me to. They do not want me to get off of my, that because what it has helped me with, not only the depression, but the anger. It has helped me with the anger. Uh, so, uh, you know, but I, I go in and I have it checked and all of that. Uh, so medication is good. I think it's essential, particularly if it's clinical depression. It can be just prescribed uh, like on a short-term basis for uh, uh, situational depression. That would be up to you and your doctor. Uh, but situational depression, when the situation is over, eventually the situational depression will lift. If it doesn't, you have clinical depression. And don't mess around with it. Please don't. It is, can be, uh, I mean, I say dangerous. Uh, what the danger part of, of having clinical depression is, <clears throat> you know, the symptoms are, uh, you know, one of them is just that loneliness, that loneliness, feeling like you're in a dark tunnel, feeling like you're in a dark hole and you can't pull yourself out of it. Uh, it is feelings of discouragement uh, and then and, and the sadness. The sadness does go along with clinical depression. And then that feeling of hopelessness. And, you know, it's like there's never going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and then lack of motiv motivation. No motivation to do anything except crawl into bed and cover up your head or get under the bed, hide out, you know, just lack of motiv motivation. Uh, and then lack of loss of interest in things that really, uh, you know, brings you lots of, of joy. And you lose that and you have no interest in anything. Uh, and that means being around family. That can be meaning uh, about being around grandchildren. can be whatever brings you joy. Clinical depression, you'll lose that. You can lose it. Uh, and then that uh, weight gain or loss. Now, a lot of people who have, you know, we treated eating disorders for years and treated all addictions for years. Uh, and we still don't know in the addiction field which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Does the depression come first? And I think it does in some people. I think some addicts uh, and eating disorder people, I think some have the depression and then self-medicate with drugs and alcohol and food. Now others, I think, I make this up, they get into using drugs and alcohol and and 
have an, an eating disorder and a depression can follow that. <clears throat> but many of your addicts and uh, you know alcoholics and eating disorder people do suffer with clinical depression. Now, in my opinion, in working with alcoholics and drug addicts, <clears throat> doctors are, and I am not badging you know, doctors at all, but doctors, some doctors are real quick to diagnose or to, uh, to prescribe uh, medication for alcoholics and drug addicts early in recovery. I'm not for that. I am not for that. What I want to do is let's get them sober. Let's see what we've got. Because many of our clients anymore that come in, we very few, very seldom see a pure alcoholic. A pure alcoholic is someone that that is the only drug that they use. Many of our clients, you know, can use drugs, uh, prescription drugs, street drugs, uh, and they'll come in with prescriptions from a lot of different doctors. And, uh, you know, and we don't, and then we have a psychiatrist and is a is therapist, we don't, we don't, touch that medication without the psychiatrist's approval. And so my goal at Shades of Hope, when we get a client in, let's detox them first. Let's detox them off of everything and see what we've got. You know, if they're gonna be here for 42 days, we're gonna have time, depending on the type of mess, uh, to actually see what we're dealing with. Because like I said, some of them will come in with a sack full of meds. Uh, and so you never see what sobriety really is until you get them plain and sober. Uh, but that's left up to the psychiatrist. That's not left up to me or the therapist because, uh, you know, it takes a village, it takes the whole team to work with a, a client. And so when it comes to medication and taking people off of medication, detoxing them, or adding meds, that's the doctor's uh, call, not ours. Uh, but as an owner of a treatment center, uh, my belief system is very strongly, you know, uh, uh, relayed to the doctors is that I prefer clients to be on as low a meds as they can be unless they have the appropriate diagnosis. Otherwise, let's get them sober with everything. Okay, so the weight gain and loss is what I started. Uh, you know, people complain a lot of times they don't want to take medication for depression, the SSRIs, because they'll say, oh, a side effect can be weight gain. And it's not that measurable. Uh, what I find with people with eating disorders who get on a certain type of medication, that they read on there that that is uh, one of the side effects is weight gain. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe this is a judgment call. To me, it seems like that gives them a free <laughs> freedom to overeat and they start overeating. Now, what they're, they're talking about is there's a tendency to gain weight. Now, the tendency is if you overeat, you will gain weight, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I'm just throwing that in there. Uh, and then there will be, uh, you know, if you're in cl uh, clinical depression, a lot of people stop eating and they will lose weight and you can't get them to eat. Uh, their motivation for doing anything is gone. Uh, and then they have problems with sleep, either wanting to sleep all the time or not being able to sleep. Uh, and just very low energy, low energy. And then if they've been real active in their lives, at life especially, they will get uh, excessive guilt. They'll just feel so guilty for not being able to get up, suit up, show up, and be normal, you know, for their family. Uh, and so they get very guilty for having the, the mental illness of depression, and it's not about guilt. This is a brain chemistry uh, illness. Uh, and then they get into the inability to concentrate or make sound decisions. And then the bottom line to clinical depression is suicide. And if you are around someone or you know someone, or if you have been clinically depressed yourself, you must voice that. If you feel like that you want to 
uh, people will say things, well, I don't really want to die. I would just like to go to sleep and not wake up. Uh, yeah, that is dying. That is a thought of wanting to die. When you start saying those things, or you hearing a family member say, you know, well, I don't really want to die. I just don't want to live. That's a death wish. Uh, pay attention to that. And then uh, people with, uh, uh, I guess this is true confession time. All of you know my story. But, you know, I had uh, suicide uh, runs in a lot of families. And it ran in my family. My grandfather attempted suicide many times and lived to be 93 years old. My mother, uh, he wasn't healthy, mentally healthy, but he breathed in and out till he was 93. My mother the same way attempted suicide numerous times. Uh, and then I picked that up. My first suicide thought was at age eight. Uh, and I was already starting in, uh, with the, my overeating. I was already morbidly obese. And I started school one day and they, I had to cross a, a real uh, 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 traffic, I mean, uh, a busy street, a very busy street. And I was so, I think I had clinical depression, not clinical, I was very sad. And I was sad about my mother and I was depressed. And I got to that busy street at eight years of age and I thought, I'll just walk out in front of one of those trucks. And then my next thought was, well, I wonder who will be at my funeral. You know, a lot of people who think about suicide ask themselves, I wonder if anybody will care to come to the funeral. And then the next thing I thought of, now I was eight years old on my way to school, I, and, and I was a compulsive overeater. My next thought was, I wonder what they're having <clears throat> for lunch today. Then I remembered the day of the week and I remembered what they had and I liked what they were having and I thought, well, I'd kill myself tomorrow. I'm gonna go to school and have lunch there. You know, so my eating disorder in a lot of ways kept me uh, <clears throat> alive until I could find recovery. Uh, and and I would put off, uh, it was, and it, now I know this sounds sick and I've got some therapists down there, but this in the, is in the early days is that I would get the pain of living in a house where I grew up. What it was so painful. Uh, I would think uh, many times, not just at age eight, but many times, I can make it through tonight. You know, I can get mother to the hospital. We can get her a shot of Demerol. I can make it through the night. I'll spend the night at the hospital with her, blah, 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 because I'm gonna kill myself tomorrow anyway. I would say, you know, that would be my goal. I could make it because I'm going to kill myself tomorrow. That's not a way to live, folks. Uh, but that was the only tool, the only rationale that I had because that was what I was I witnessed with my mother. You know, if life gets too hard, just go kill yourself. Uh, and by the grace of God, God literally removed those suicidal thoughts from my brain. I no longer have those suicidal thoughts. Uh, but the last one almost took my life, and uh, I don't take that lightly. So, uh, anyway, when you're around someone that's depressed, and a lot of times people won't let you know. They really won't let you know. They try to hide it as much as they can. And, but be, uh, be leery and be watchful, uh, because suicide is real. Uh, you know, without breaking anybody's confidentiality, we had a beloved client was doing well, doing well, and long story short, the depression got so bad she could not stand it any longer. This is how bad depression can get. And she had everything to live for, and she couldn't live. She chose to kill herself. and. Uh, but her family, in a lot of ways, was relieved. As much as they miss her, they saw her suffer for so, so many years. So, clinical depression is real. <laughs> Do not ever think that it's not. Situational depression is real. Uh, and uh, so get help if you have either one. And I want to give you some other things to do uh, for depression and uh either one, clinical or situational depression. Uh, besides medication, one of the things, there is a 12-step program called Emotions Anonymous. 
and it's been going on about as long or longer than Overeaters Anonymous has. I mean, it's been around a long time, and it's uh, Emotions Anonymous, and it's in most cities, and you know, a lot, a lot of times find them, and uh, there'll be meetings in, in hospitals or psych centers. We, uh, they have a meeting out here at the psychiatric center here in Abilene. Uh, Emotions Anonymous. Uh, and it's not all about everyone sitting around talking about how bad they feel. I've, I've attended some of them. They work the same 12-step program that, that any of us do with any addiction. And what it does, it will march you up. Those tw uh, 12 steps will march you up face to face with the God of your understanding. And there is no failure in that, you know, if you take the steps. And so another thing that is good for depression is daily meditation. Now, it may take more than one daily meditation, but incorporate meditation into your life. And then do anything that you might can do to change your routine. For instance, you know, there are people that are so depressed they can't get out of their own house. And what we recommend or what I recommend is take put one step in front of the other, go outside. You know, it's beginning to be springtime. Go outside, breathe some air, uh, do something to change the scenery for just a few minutes. Uh, you know, I was reading somewhere the other day, uh, someone that has suffered from depression wrote in a list of things uh, that, she tried, that she did that was helpful. And one of them was taking showers. And she said, take a cold shower or take, and then take a warm shower, not a bath, but the shower, and the, the you know, the, the uh, shower head, get right under it and let it just, you know, come down over you. And then dry off and use lotion. It doesn't even have to be expensive lotion. Do something to connect with your skin, putting the lotion on your body. And then dress in plain clothes. People that are really depressed, a lot of times don't bathe regularly or they won't change their clothes. So put on some clean, good smelling, loose fitting clothes, uh, something that's comfortable. <clears throat> and, and see if your outsides, you clean up your outsides, it might change the inside a little bit. Uh, I'm not saying this is a cure for depression, it's not, but it's some, some helpful, some things that might be helpful. Uh, and then, uh, Another thing is, <clears throat> you know, when people are really, get really depressed, they're not motivated to do anything. And uh, nothing, and of course, I am kind of a neat freak, but I am uh, today, any mess that is made is mine. I'm the only one basically, you know, here, and I clean up my own messes. But one of the things that, uh, that brings me joy, sparks joy in me, and I think this helps, could help people that are depressed, is to don't take a major <laughs> uh, project of trying to get things straight. Just go to a dresser drawer and maybe, or maybe a kitchen drawer and straighten up one little area. Anything that you, that you can connect your brain and your hands to. It, using your hands, those small motor skills will wake up, help wake up the brain. So do something constructive. And it doesn't, don't do no great big project, start little. Because if you start big, you're gonna get frustrated. You know, if you're in depression, you're gonna get frustrated and it's not gonna work and you're gonna you know, put yourself down and think, well, say I can't even do that right. So start small, do little small things. Uh, and then reach out to others. <clears throat> you know, and this is about you have to really force yourself to pick up that telephone. Uh, and it's not always about calling. It is very important to talk to someone about your depression and what's going on. But it's not always about you talking about yourself. It's about picking up the phone and calling someone in the program that you haven't seen for a while, or a neighbor, or maybe a new person that's moved into your community. Just reach out, pick up the phone, and you know, inquire about someone else. It's anything that we can do to get out of ourselves for a moment. And 
I have seen people, and I know myself, you know, like I said, I started just thinking, well, you know, I've never been depressed. Well, of course I have. Uh, and I've done a lot of work to, uh, to get out of the depression. One of the things that I would do, uh, and my anger was and rage was tied real close to the depression. And one of the things uh, early on, uh, when I still had children at home, uh, I would set the timer on my stove and give me, myself five minutes to be happy. You know, now with situational depression and sadness, you've got a choice. You can tweak that brain and choose to be happy. You can always choose to be happy with clinical depression, but you can attempt to set a timer on your stall and say, five minutes, I'm gonna do everything I can do to feel happy in this moment, you know. Uh, and, you know, going back to talk to other people about it, people who understand, don't try to talk to your family members unless they understand, you know, and then if you're going to a, uh, which I highly recommend you get with a good therapist, uh, and sometimes you may need inpatient treatment. One of the things uh, we treat people, they come here for depression only. Uh, we thought, oh man, man, that's a huge thing. They will come for depression. And invariably, when we start working on those childhood issues, that's where the depression started. And it started then, and they built on it and built on it and built on it. Uh, am I saying that they walk out of here and never have a problem with depression? No, I'm not saying that. When they leave here, they know how to treat it. Uh, and they know that life is worth more, uh, you know, worth <clears throat> living more than staying in that dark place and uh, doing whatever you can do to get yourself out of that dark place. Music, listening to music is another thing. Listening to music and movement therapy. Now, I will tell you, I'm not the best at that. You know, I've, I don't have much rhythm. Now, Cam does. She is a dancer <laughs> deluxe. Yes, oh, she is. <laughs> and I love to sit and watch her dance, and I love to watch her sing Hello, Dolly. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we go to Misty's for karaoke meetings, and, you know, I can't sing a tune, but I've got, yes, good, I've got good listening ears. You know, get with the community, sing, play music, dance, you know, uh, if you're not doing it, but in the house, do something to lift the mood. Uh, so, it's, uh, I could go on and on about sadness. I will tell you, sadness, you know, like I said, if something happens and you're sad, and I, I go back to my all my dying plants, I was sad about that that I don't want to stay in sadness. And so, you know, I had planted these little flowers out there in the greenhouse in little bulbs. And so I brought them in the house and I want you to look at them. I've got me a garden. I'm sitting here smelling them. Oh my Lord, they smell good. They're beautiful. Uh, and that is bringing me happiness. <laughs> you know, it doesn't take much for me anymore uh, to be, uh, I mean, I don't have anything, anything, zero, zero to be unhappy about. Now, if I was a mind to, I could probably find some things. I look out here, my beautiful yard is a mess. I've lost all my shrubs and all. Now, I can just get down off uh, on that. But, you know, I mean, why do that? Why I get all sad about it? You know, I'm going to come up with a new plan for my garden. We're starting fresh. It's going to look different. So, uh so what I'm saying, when you really, when it's sadness or situational depression, something that has happened, like a death. Now, grief is, is a part, sad, depression and pain is a part of the grief process. In the grief process, we go through the grief process. But if you get stuck there on depression, you might need some help with medication. <clears throat> and... After a while, and I'm not saying this for clinical depression, but what I'm saying, you can choose, folks, to be happy or sad. It is a choice. And, you know, you can be, you know, have that hang dog look all you want to, and be down and out, and bless my heart, 
all you want to and for an addict that is a dangerous place for us to be because when we are in uh, you know we usually get sadness over something that somebody's done to us and then that moves from a sadness to a resentment and then a resentment is then we might even go blow up at them and then we get mad at ourselves for blowing up you know for having that rage so now not only do we have resentment toward them but now we have a self-resentment mad at ourselves and then that self-resentment moves to self-pity and that is the danger place for an addict self-pity is pour me pour me pour me another drink or pour me another milkshake or whatever it is the poor maze and i will tell you the pain of that is so great that's what takes addicts back to the substance because we can remember that sense of ease and comfort and then we get to bless in our heart and all that and that's why we need to get this is why the pandemic has been so hard on addicts because you can't get up go get in your car drive to a meeting you know i had never ever and since 1968 when i started going to 12-step meetings i've never been to a bad meeting now there's some that are better than others folks but to say that i've been to a bad meeting i haven't the action of getting in my car and going to the meeting and sitting there and participating will lift your mood you really well nothing else will and so when since we can't do it uh face to face Zoom meetings, I have people that I work with that are doing a Zoom or two or three or four a day. You know, it is taking action, taking action to do something different. So, that is about all I have. We could talk a lot about sadness and depression. But if we keep talking about it, we're all going to get depressed over it <laughs> or sad over it. So, I know some of you on here have suffered from all three of these or all of them, you know, sadness because you're a human being, and some of you have had situational depression, and some have had clinical depression. So let's talk about it, and I've got some therapists on here. I encourage you to uh, share in uh, what has worked with uh, your clients or with yourself, or ask any questions, whatever. This is your time. Who wants to go first? <laughs>